mean value. Remember the mean value theorem? Well, here's what the theorem says. Suppose I got some function f, it's defined in the closed interval a to b, and its values are real numbers. It's a continuous function, so it's continuous on the closed interval between a and b, and on the open interval between a and b, it's differentiable. Now with these assumptions, here's what happens. Then there's some point c between a and b, it doesn't tell me how to find that point, but there is one, so that this happens, the derivative of the function at the point c is equal to f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. Let me rearrange this a bit. So I'm just going to change the names of some of these variables. So I'll write f prime not of c but of z is equal to f not of b but of x. And I'm going to keep the name of a uh, the same. So I'll call that f of a. OK, and then I'll again divide by x minus a. Now I'm going to multiply both sides of this by the quantity x minus a. And what do I get? Well, I get f prime of z times the quantity x minus a. And that's equal to this numerator here, f of x minus f of a. So I'll put an x in there and an a in there. And I'm going to add f of a to both sides. And I'm going to start with f of x on this side. So I'm just going to write this. f of x is equal to what? f of a, f of a plus this quantity here, f prime of z times x minus a. Why would I want to write it that way? Well, I could write this in yet another way. I could write it like this. This is the same thing here, but just written a little bit differently. f of x equals f of a plus a remainder term, r sub 0 of x, where r sub 0 of x is this, the derivative of f at some point z between x and a, divided by 1 factorial, which is just 1, times x minus a to the first power. But when I write it like this, it looks exactly like an instance of Taylor's theorem. Well, let's remember what Taylor's theorem says. So suppose that you got some function f, takes real inputs, produces real outputs, and I'm just going to assume it's smooth. I don't want to worry too much about the exact differentiability conditions that I need. All right, and f of x is a sum, little n goes from 0 to big N, of the little nth derivative of f at the point a, divided by n factorial, times x minus a to the nth power, plus this remainder term, big R sub big N of x. Then this happens. Big R sub big N of x is given by this, the big N plus first derivative of f at some point z between x and a, divided by big N plus 1 factorial, times x minus a to the big N plus first power. And think about what happens here when you plug in big N equals 0. And in that case, what you get is exactly what we had before. It's f of x equals, this is just the n equals 0 term here, plus a remainder term. And that remainder term then, when big N is 0, is exactly the derivative of f at some point z divided by 1 factorial times x minus a to the first power. It looks exactly like the mean value theorem. So Taylor's theorem is a whole lot like a souped up version of the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem tells you something about your first derivative, and Taylor's theorem is telling you information about your higher derivatives. And this isn't just a theoretical story. I mean, you can actually sort of see this in the real world. Let's imagine the following scenario. Well, let's let f of t be your position at time t seconds after the beginning of the experiment. And when the experiment begins with f of 0, where are you? f of 0 is 0, so you're at the origin and you're not moving. Your velocity at time 0 is 0, so the derivative of your position at time 0 is 0. And I would prefer that we survive the experience, so I'd like to control the acceleration that, uh, that we experience. So the second derivative of f at any time t be no bigger than 250 meters per second squared. This is you know, 25 g's or so, and I think humans 
don't do so well above 25 G's. So this is a reasonable thing if you want to uh, you know, make this a healthy trip. And now the question is how big can F of 60 seconds be? How far can you get starting at zero, not moving, how far away can you be after 60 seconds? I want to bound our acceleration so that we survive the trip. Now this problem doesn't have to be approached using Taylor series, but we can do it that way. So let's start down that path. So I'll write this down. F of t is F of zero plus F prime of zero times t minus zero, right? Those are the first two terms in the Taylor series expansion for f, plus r sub one of t, this is the remainder term. And what do I know about the remainder term? Well, r sub one of t is equal to the second derivative, at some point z, divided by two factorial times t minus zero squared. I can bound that remainder term. Right, because I don't want to be injured during this trip, I don't want to be accelerating more than about 25 Gs, I can now control something about r sub one. Right? I know something about how big r sub one is. The absolute value of r sub one of t is less than or equal to how big can the second derivative be at any point, 250 divided by two factorial times t squared. Now I can say something about how large f of t is. So f of t is less than or equal to f of zero plus f prime of zero times t plus this quantity, 250 divided by two factorial is 125 times t squared. Now I know what f of zero is. I'm assuming that I'm starting at a point I'm calling the origin. And I know something about the derivative of f at zero. I'm assuming that I start my journey motionless. So this quantity here is equal to zero plus zero times t plus just 125 t squared. I gave us one minute of travel time. So f of 60 seconds is no bigger than 125 times 60 squared which is equal to 450,000. And this is meters, so f of 60 seconds is no bigger than 450 kilometers. So if we're currently stationary, I'm not moving currently, one minute from now, I could be 450 kilometers away and probably live to, to tell the tale, maybe. But the other issue, of course, is that after that minute, I'm traveling at just some insanely high speed. But, uh, you know, at least I'm 450 kilometers away.